Christianity, Denominations, and Cults, June 25th, 2019, Tuesday. Thanks for stopping by The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long on the YouTube channel. I am your host, Dave Long. 37 years ago, Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, stopped by a chapel service at my Bible college in Lakeland, Florida to talk to me. He gave me the gift and the commission to understand and to teach the living Word of God to the church. He commanded me to call my ministry the Shepherd's Voice. I am here in response to his command. He is the Shepherd. He is the Good Shepherd. I am his voice. My name is Dave Long. I was raised as a Lutheran pastor's son in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. My father had a church of 2,500 members, and I was pushed through all things Lutheran. Then, at the age of 24, after fleeing a Lutheran college <laughs> in a pre-law major that was chosen for me by my parents, my guidance counselors, and my brothers, much like Martin Luther, I left law preparation and enrolled in an Assembly of God Bible College. Martin Luther left law school to become a Catholic priest. Both of us disappointed our fathers. <laughs> Martin Luther's departure and vow to become a priest was precipitated by a walk through a forest during a thunderstorm. <laughs> he was afraid he was going to be killed by lightning. So he vowed to God, if you let me live, I'll be a minister, I'll be a priest. And he did. Well, my my thing was not quite so dramatic. I just basically was very unhappy with the idea of helping rich people argue about divorce settlements and branches of trees over other people's yards. And I, I found the law profession, in my opinion, of no eternal significance at all and of little worldly importance. And on the other hand, I can't possibly think of anything more important on the planet to do than to deal with man's eternal futures. And it's taking me quite some time to arrive at that view. Actually back in the 1980s when I received this initial call from Jesus I thought I have no idea <laughs> why why he so uh, you know, why would he be concerned about involving me in ministry? The the world is in great shape. In the You have to understand, 35 years ago, the Church of Jesus Christ on planet Earth in the United States of America was a far different creature than it is today. Uh, back then, people took God very seriously. They didn't walk around with iPods and uh, iPads and other glowing screened technological devices strapped to their ears and <laughs> eyes all day long. So the church back in the United States of America, people actually went outside to play <laughs> after school. They didn't rush in to play video games of war. And uh, there were miracles happening in the churches. And, you know, I thought, what could possibly uh, disrupt this great move of God? Surely, I'm a fifth wheel. All things are in good hands. There's no need for me. You know, you wonder how some of the evangelists through time must have thought about their current atmosphere of the nations they lived in and wondered to themselves, but God knows what's happening and what's coming down the line for a nation before we do, and his wisdom is far beyond ours. And actually, as far as being a serious Christian and being involved heavily with the church, I was a mere babe in 1980. I had uh, been exposed to the Pentecostal things in the 1970s, in the late 70s, uh, you know, raw just just exposed to these things on television and a couple local congregations. And up till then, I, I thought 
Christianity was you go to the local Lutheran church for 45 minutes on Sunday morning, you know, at least a couple times a month, and there you go. Well, so after fleeing a Lutheran college who at this point in this message will remain nameless, as a pre-law major, uh, I, I literally went on strike and refused to go to class and said, why am I wasting all this time, money, and work on something I have absolutely no interest in? I uh, then uh, eventually left the law preparation. Let's see, that was in that year. And then, uh, yeah, it took me a couple of years before I uh, went to an Assembly of God Bible College in Lakeland, Florida. Martin Luther, leaving his law school to become a Catholic priest, disappointed his father, and I disappointed my father. He wanted me to become a lawyer. He, Even though he was a minister, he uh, had a very dark view of the Pentecostals and the Assembly of God denomination. In no way, shape, or form did my Lutheran pastor, father, with a doctorate, who had a membership of 2,500 people in his congregation, no way did he want me to become some fanatical, flaky, <laughs> holy roller, off-the-wall, Pentecostal, Assembly of God minister. Well, he, he got his wish. <laughs> but I did not become a lawyer. Thank God. There is nothing more important on this earth today in the occupation of men than to discuss and teach the tenets of Christianity and show people the way to heaven. I am here to rob, I am here to rob and plunder the kingdom of hell. And Satan knows that. He has been trying to kill me since I was two years old. That's a whole nother message and a sermon. We won't bore you with that right now, but it's just been obvious. He's been trying to shut me down financially. He's been trying to kill me off many different times, many different ways throughout my years. I realized after two years of the Assembly of God pastoral ordination training thing that I reached the end of their knowledge and entered into the area of their disbelief, error, and blasphemy. I have independently studied man and the Bible, Christianity, and the faith for the past 37 years. The real training of a minister of Jesus Christ begins when you leave school and enter into the world. Most, if not all, seminaries and Bible colleges are in heavy error. Their teaching and training is polluted, and it's watered down with the theology of secular humanism, modern traditions, and sacred cows of ancient Christian denominations that have long since left their founders' faiths. The Lutheran Church in America today is a far cry from the teaching of Martin Luther. Luther prescribed prayer for Christians when you wake up, before and after the three meals of the day, and before you go to sleep. He prayed the Lord's Prayer every time he prayed. With getting up, going to sleep, and the twice-a-meal prayers, Martin Luther prayed the Lord's Prayer himself at least eight times a day. He believed in keeping his accounts with God short keeping a short account between himself and God concerning his sins. He was terrified at the idea of dying and having unconfessed sin in his life. He has an interesting 52-volume uh, uh, body of, of his work and his writing that encompasses his life that you can buy and uh, it's a lot cheaper, actually, than buying the physical paper books to buy the DVD or the CD that has uh, the writing on it. And you can put all 52 volumes in front of yourself. Uh, I think it's a couple hundred dollars to buy the DVDs. And you can uh, read for yourself on your computer screen, but you save a lot of money versus buying the individual books. I guess they're about $20 a piece. There's 50 volumes. So you're talking about $1,000 if you buy the, the library. I have gained many insights from many men who are great teachers of God on earth today. I won't discuss them all and go through them today, but many of them you've seen on television. Many people, 
criticized heavily the people you see on television. But you know what? If somebody's moving in real prophecy, if somebody is giving a living message that speaks to your heart, if someone is actually working the miracles through the Holy Spirit of God in the name of Jesus on television, and people are receiving instant miraculous healings or other kinds of miracles, I am not going to criticize that ministry. I am going to take apart and put back together that ministry, buy the tapes, watch the broadcasts, and listen to them to find out what they know that I don't. So I've gained a lot of insight from many men who have, you know, are great teachers of God on earth today. And I've sat alone by myself in my house and meditated on the Bible and seen truths I've never heard preached from anyone's pulpit. The Bible is a gold mine. You do not harvest its treasure by walking quickly over the surface of the ground where it is buried. You have to dig and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you, and it takes time. A Bible on your coffee table is the equivalent of you standing on the ground of a gold mine. There may be gold underneath your feet, but unless you own the ground and you get a pick and a shovel and start digging down to get the gold, you, uh, you will never realize the treasure. You may live and die without, hev- without having ever unearthed your treasure that lies just beneath your feet. Men die in poverty who have been walking over a wealth and a treasure their entire lives. There's a famous story. I forget who told it. I'm not even sure that it's true. But they said out in California there was a couple who uh, had a small ranch. And uh, they heard about the gold strike in the state of California. And uh, they decided they wanted to spend the rest of their lives looking for their own personal gold mine. So they set out to run around the country or the state, whatever it was. And I think they spent just about everything they had uh, just searching for their own personal gold mine. And I believe the name of the place is Sutter's Mill. These were the Sutters. (laughs) And beneath their own feet, on the ground where they were living on the ranch that they owned was one of the biggest richest gold mines in the, in the state of California that's how it is with the Bible you don't open that cover you don't read what's in those pages you don't comprehend what you've got there you don't understand if you don't understand that the Bible's a seed bag and it's promises and it's not a historic story of things that are metaphors or nice little entertaining children's stories. It's God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it for a man 2,000 years ago, he'll do it for you today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changeth not. And he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't say, well, you know, Peter and Paul in the New Testament Those were special people. They were specially anointed. And I picked them. You know, just like uh, Moses or Joshua. These were special people who were specially anointed. And, you know, we're sons and daughters of God now. We're not like the Old Testament people in which the Holy Spirit laid upon the person or was near the person. The Holy Spirit today in Christians is actually inside of us. That's a whole other message uh, illustrated well by Jesus talking about John the Baptist and said uh, the greatest prophet who ever lived in the Old Testament was John the Baptist. But anyone in the kingdom of heaven, born again person, somebody who enters into the faith of Jesus Christ is greater than him because... Because John the Baptist said he's coming and he's here now. And he was pointing out Jesus Christ. But the Christian doesn't say he's here around us. He said, the Christian says he's inside of us. So 
The Bible's a gold mine. You have to dig and allow the Spirit of God to speak, and it takes some time of study. Our instant Christianity in America today is the devil's finest work of all time. Christians in America have busied themselves so greatly with the secular world and with false religions that he has polluted and watered down the pure water of the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ incarnate. I invite you to carefully listen to what I am going to say today and to judge by the Word of God, which is the Bible. I refer more often to the New Testament than to the Old Testament, not because the Old Testament is not valid, but because the teaching concepts of the true church are found in the New Testament Gospels and the letters of the Apostle Paul. That is, the concepts we're addressing, what is the church, what is the true church, are defined by Jesus in the Gospels and by the Apostle Paul in the letters in the New Testament. At times I'll be going off script. You can tell when I go off script. I will be reaching for words and concepts as I'm speaking. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will bring things up to me as I am reading my printed message. You'll probably know when this is happening. Some of what I say may be speaking directly to you. The Holy Spirit has a way of speaking directly to people through giant international ministries even when they are preaching on television. Benny Hinn was just such a man for me. In the past he had seemed to speak directly to me in his messages, although this has not been the case, probably for me for, for years. Or here or there he'll say something that really plucks one of my heartstrings and applies to me directly today. But like I said, I'm referring back in my mind to the late 1980s and the 90s uh, in which it seems I could turn on his message on television and he seemed to be speaking directly to me. So I have capriciously entitled today's message or meditation or sermon, whatever you want to call this, Your Church Sucks, and probably the pastor does too. (laughs) <laughs> what an awful thing to say, Dave. <laughs> Your pastor is working their keyboard fingers to the bone on their 10-minute Sunday morning sermon. Why that pastor of yours had to miss his favorite crime drama show just to polish up his fast food instant message. Americans have church today like they eat meals at McDonald's. They want the message to taste good and feel good. They want it to be quick. They want to get out of church and back to their TVs as quickly as possible. It would be great if they could just tune in church and never have to leave the house. Except McDonald's does not deliver. (laughs) Welcome to America, the land of cults. The great American religion of false Christianity. Let's find out if the church you are going to is lying to you or empowering you. I am talking about the whole denomination not just your local pastor and your local church house. Do you know if your church cares if you go to hell? Well, you know, it's kind of easy to judge if you go to say hi to your pastor after the service. Does, is he blowing off people and trying to get out of there and get to his pizza, which is probably a standing order with Domino's? <laughs> Do you know if your church pastor cares about you and if you go to hell what are they doing to keep you from going there what are they doing and teaching you to keep you alive and well until you get to heaven does your pastor give you the impression he just doesn't care have they sat down and retired after getting their seminary diploma does your pastor at your local church give you an impression that they don't care about you and your life in your eternal future. Have they sat down in their minds and spirits and retired from ministry after getting their seminary diploma and are now just collecting paychecks? A lot of churches around this country today have retired pastors who are showing up every Sunday for work and still collecting paychecks. Their pastors have stopped reading and meditating in the Word of God, or worse yet, never did study the Bible. The New Testament Church versus 
today's church. Before we get into this, let me make sure that we're on and streaming. I am my own tech person. Yes, we are streaming and we are recording. If for some reason the streaming here fails or it's too buffered and it doesn't get through properly, I will upload to uh, YouTube and Google. I will upload this as recorded on my own computer through my crappy little law. Uh, uh, thankfully today we don't have to use the uh, camera. I'm just uh, letting you see a slideshow. Oh, did I turn that on or not? Oh, yes, I did. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> slideshow cut, yes. Because I, I've actually done entire hour-long messages before and not turned on the slideshow or the camera <laughs> and been at, been at the blank screen in the beginning of the broadcast, the blank cue setup and stayed there and people listened to the audio but couldn't see anything or uh you know sometimes i'll uh, set it up with a slideshow sometimes i'll set it up you know if i uh do the hair and get the lighting right and the sun shining right outside and everything and i can arrange the background behind me i'll put myself on live camera and sometimes i'll let you see what i'm reading right off the screen and what i'm looking at i did that yesterday with this message originally but uh, I found that it is a little distracting to see me doing the technical things over here and to notice when I'm reading off the script and when I go off on a tangent and explain something in more detail so back to the message the New Testament church versus today's church well briefly the New Testament church had miracles of power. They were in unity. They loved each other. They hung out with each other. They visited in each other's houses daily. They had church daily. They were extremely generous. If there was anybody with needs, other people who had a, an abundance in an area would uh, give to the ones with needs. There was teaching from the apostles versus today's church where in it's located in a building that they do a lot of heavy fundraising for and they build something called a church house and today's church largely doesn't matter whose denomination you're talking about today's church has no power no miracles and evidence there are usually a lot of division even within the church house a lot of stinginess uh, you know good luck getting anything off of a church member in most church houses today teaching from the new age movements is dominant you know freely ministers feel licensed to reach into new age movements and religions and eastern religions and the philosophies of man and spice up the christian bible and the word of god with some of that antichrist satanic demonic teaching that is not the Word of God, that pollutes the Word of God and waters down the Word of God and the message. So therefore, most people in America today, in most mainline denominational churches, are getting watered down messages or polluted messages. Worse yet, messages that have been mixed with things that are directly against the scripture teaching in the Bible. Most denominational churches in America today, now, you know, hear what I'm saying here and how I'm saying this. In my opinion, most denominational churches in America today are Christian cults more than they are evidence of the Christian religion, and here's why. On today's The Shepherd's Voice, with Dave Long. I like to open weekly meditations with prayer. This is a free form prayer and we're going before the almighty throne of the living God, our heavenly father together in the mighty name above all other names, Jesus, who is, after all, the anointed one. And if you didn't know, Christ means, Christ is the Greek word that means in English, the anointed one or anointed 
So, you know, Christos, and uh, in, in the Hebrew language, in the Old Testament, he was the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Anointed One. Jesus Messiah in the Old Testament, Jesus the Christ in Greek New Testament language, and Jesus the Anointed One in English. And uh, our prayer is, Father God, we come before your throne today in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God. And we look to the printed Word of God, which is your food and is your blood and is your body. And we eat from your body and we drink your blood today, Lord Jesus Christ, by going into and meditating on your Word. And we pray that the grace and the power that is available to us in the name of Jesus in the church today as Paul prayed in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians in chapter 1 of Ephesians that our eyes and our ears and our spirits would be open to and our minds would be open to just what is the power and the might and the grace and the force of heaven that is available to us who are in Christ Jesus. And bless the receiver and bless the message giver and bless our households. Watch over us. We bind up the devil from coming against us and we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our households, over our messages, over our spirits, our minds and our bodies, over our possessions and relationships and over our families, over our jobs, over our prosperity and over our relationships. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name and before your throne we bow and we say Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. By our definition, the definition of the Shepherd's Voice Ministry with Dave Long, Christianity is the true faith in the Lord Jesus, whose recorded letter of love to you personally is contained, untainted, unpolluted in what we call the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the written document of the incarnate second part of the Trinity. The written document of the incarnate second part of the Trinity, Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ by biblical scripture is the Word of God as defined in John chapter 1 as the incarnate breath of the living Lord God, the Heavenly Father, God Almighty. Jesus is the holy spoken word of the living God, the embodied word of God Almighty. When God, the Heavenly Father, speaks, Jesus comes out of his mouth. For Jesus is the word of God. He is the breath of God, the force and the power that proceeds forth from God the Father, the word, the, the message is, and the plans are made within God the Father. They are breathed through Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the force and the power of the living God. Denominations are Christian faiths of different interpretations of Holy Scripture, the Word of God. They each in their own way, to lesser or greater degree, depart from the written Word of God in the teaching of their beliefs from their pulpits in their ministers and seminaries or Bible colleges. How do I know this? Well, let's call this simple logic. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. There are roughly 3,000 denominations. As per Wikipedia's authorization, they say, let's say in the United States, in the Christian religion, Christian faith, there are about 3,000 different denominations that they list. This does not count, not count, sub denominations or divisions of those individual 3,000 denominations around the world or within churches. And you know, uh, being raised a Lutheran minister's son, I was privy to a lot of stuff which people sitting in the pews were not. And let me tell you something. There is a great division, even within one denomination, 
between the pastors in that denomination. Uh, you go to a Baptist, <laughs> you go to a Baptist annual convention of their pastors <laughs> in the United States, and you'll probably see a fist fight <laughs> on the floor because that's how much, even inside of one denomination, <laughs> that the pastors agree with each other. And I'm laughing. It's funny because, you know, this is the antithesis of what you think men of God would behave like. But, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, I would hear my dad in kind of covert and breathy tones, you know, not not on a regular basis, not out loud, not to a lot of people. You know, he'd have his own critical little thoughts about other area Lutheran ministers and what he thought they were doing right or wrong. There was scandals in the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania, you know, which includes Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. Nazareth is uh, is a uh, suburb of Bethlehem, really. It's Nazareth is about four miles north of Bethlehem in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, my dad, you know, there was, oh, one of the Lutheran pastors in one of the cities in the area was running around <laughs> with another woman and cheating on his wife and you know he was tossed out of the ministry and placed on some kind of a watch and some kind of a discipline he had to work to get back into the ministry for a couple of years on sabbatical and there's things that you don't know about you you have no idea how little unity and how little agreement there really is in the church today and we only have one book we got one book we got the Bible. We've got the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. <laughs> you know, probably God the Father thought, they can't screw this up. It's only one book. All they have to do is study it and read it through at least one time. And the ministers who lead the congregations will have a pretty good idea. And we'll have unity. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> it's incredible the amount of disagreement and error and variations. So if you have 3,000 different denominations, my point is if some of those denominations agreed with each other exactly, they would not be separate denominations. They would be the same denomination. They would join up. Well, you know, the, the Lutheran Church had a, uh, had a uh, you know, what do you call it when they merge? Back in the 70s, I think, they... They took, uh, I think it was the American Lutheran Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and a couple other divisions and combined them. We still, I, as far as I know, there's still the Missouri Synod Lutherans and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Lutherans, and I think there's the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans. You know, and that's just in the Lutheran Church. I don't know nearly as much about divisions and subdivisions of other churches. Uh, the Baptists, oh my God, you know, or Southern Baptists, there's, uh, there's all kinds of different Baptist denominations. And uh, you just can't see the sign on a church in front of the building on a Sunday morning that says Baptist and assume <laughs> that they're the same flavor of the Baptist church in your hometown that you're used to. But <clears throat> I've been blessed to be exposed for a number of years to uh, four different denominations specifically. I was raised very Lutheran. I did everything Lutheran. I went to a Lutheran college. I was in Luther League. I was an acolyte. I was in the church choir. I uh, went to a Lutheran college. I said that. And uh, my dad had a summer home in a Lutheran cottage community. <laughs> so, you know, I know Lutherans. I know what they're like. I know what they believe. Um, some of these faiths deny great portions of the New Testament. Such denominations cannot, by definition, be considered to be Christian. They have ripped out such great sections of Scripture and chapters of the New Testament. Now, I'll tell you how the Lutheran Church handles it. Uh, they each in their own way, depart from the written word and the teaching, uh, their beliefs from their pulpits. And uh, the Lutheran Church handles it when they come across a controversial section of Scripture, especially in the New Testament, they will have it in their reading for the day. 
they'll have three separate readings. They'll have one from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament. Uh, they have the Gospel, the Lesson, and uh, another one. I forget what that is offhand. But they'll, they'll just read over it, <laughs> and the pastor will totally ignore it in his sermon especially if it's in the letters of Paul, New Testament, and it's referring to the supernatural and the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> Got to run right past that. <laughs> I, I, I very, very seldom hear uh, pastors preach on television or local churches about John chapter 17, one of the pivotal, most important chapters of the New Testament in which Jesus Christ was defining himself, defining the body of Christ and the church on planet Earth, and defining what kinds of authority, power, and future he was leaving behind before he rose to heaven. So, the members of denominations love their church, and they love their religion, sometimes more than they love Jesus Christ <laughs> and the truth and real Christianity in the Bible. They've fallen in love with an idol, a sect, They've made their own denomination an idol, a corrupted image of the true risen Savior, his mission, his words, his will, and his commands. As such, they have left the faith and are no longer Christian, but they have become a member of their own cult. They follow a false, unbiblical Savior and God, and some of these members of these cults would rather die than to give up their twisted, alien, demonic, new age, Wiccan-influenced, witchcraft-influenced, wizardry-influenced, sometimes even satanic Bible-influenced practices and beliefs. Don't believe me? Okay, uh, let me uh, off script here for a second. I studied the, uh, you know, I, in, when I was young, I studied the occult. I studied things about the occult. I was very open to the supernatural. Uh, did not know. Lutherans never teach you stay away from this stuff. You know, some of the stuff was we considered innocent, like hypnosis, uh, astrology, and uh, some other things in the occult. We played with Ouija boards when I was a kid. Since repented, I know how dangerous that is. I know you're opening the door wide open to demons, the devil, Satan. Uh, when you start messing with the occult apart from Jesus Christ and Christianity and uh, with the door to the spirit realm, who is Jesus Christ? You do not go into that realm without going in with God. You uh, go in by the way the Bible tells you to go in. You stay away from things that play with the supernatural. You have no idea how quickly you can become ensnared and possessed and controlled by those invisible forces that you know nothing about. And, you know, you can go into any bookstore, any secular bookstore in the country, and see a whole section on uh, uh, much deeper than things like, uh, uh, you know, astrology. You can get books on witchcraft and spells and rune stones and uh, things that are dealing with the dark black realm and the people who are in these practices and who pick these up they do not know what they're dealing with they don't know how dangerous it is I had the good fortune to actually meet uh, the ex high Satan worshipping priestess for the state of Florida who by the way <laughs> just happened to be best friends with my girlfriend's mother in Bible college, <laughs> let me say that again. When I was in Lakeland, Florida, in Bible college, my girlfriend's mother, wonderful Christian people, her mother, wonderful Christian person, her best friend was reformed and, and had become Christian, very strong Christian. And she wrote a book called The Witch That Switched. Her name was Irene Park. And Irene Park uh, was, at one time, the head and in charge of all the Satan worshipers in the state of Florida. And <clears throat> they, they went out into the woods, they had the bonfires, they danced, supposedly, according to her, 
Images would arise out of the bonfire and dance with them as they... And I won't go into it. I won't go into the practice. I'm not going to glorify Satan at all in this. But, you know, in the state of Florida, you would be shocked to know how widespread and prevalent those things are. So, <clears throat> the real question is, where is the line? Where is the true departure from Christian faith, the body of Christ, the kingdom come, the teachings and the word of the living Lord Jesus Christ? Where have our denominations... And their teachings crossed the line to the point where they are so far removed in their seminary teaching or pulpit ministries that they can no longer, by strict definition, be called Christian and part of the faith of those who are the body of Christ who are going to heaven when they cross over. Okay, well, this is a tricky area, uh, obviously, because most people agree Jesus came died he was crucified rose from the dead on the third day for redemption of the sins of man now beyond that everybody gets into divisions about what goes around that central theme and there are a lot of people who say well you know the only thing that counts is that a christian denomination acknowledges that jesus christ is the savior did die for our sins rose from the dead Beyond that, who cares? Well, I'll tell you what, who cares? If you, it's possible to totally fall from grace and the faith just knowing that mentally assenting, you know what, Jesus Christ is Lord, died for my sins, went to church as a little kid, sang the hymns there in the pretty hymnal, you know, I was there every Sunday when the church doors open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you fall into traps such as uh, grace, the, the grace error. Okay, there is grace. Without grace, we don't make it to heaven. Jesus uh, said that we make it by grace, period. It's not grace plus our works, and it's not works for sure. It is the grace of God. And today, there was a movement, especially about 10 years ago, who went way beyond grace and said, you know what? Don't worry about it because you're not going to go sinless through the day so don't worry about your lifestyle and what you do and don't do no reason to sweat because Jesus Christ died for your sins and you're saved you're going to heaven as long as you believe that well Jesus said in the New Testament your faith is not a matter of the confession out of your mouth your faith is a matter of your actions in your life style and what you do in your life it's not the ones who hear the Word of God it's the ones who do the Word of God who make it into the kingdom. Okay, how are we doing the word of God or not doing the word of God? How do we judge that? Well, we judge that because Jesus said there are sheep and goats. People who are sheep, when people are in need, they provide. When people are in need and you don't provide, you're a goat. <laughs> I didn't make that up. That's not my words. That's the Bible. Jesus Christ, part of the Godhead, said that himself he said uh, you know to the goats he'll say when I was homeless you gave me no place to 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 live when I was hungry you didn't feed me when I was thirsty you didn't give me something to drink when I was sick you didn't heal me when I was lonely you didn't visit me etc on down the line and to the sheep he's going to say when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was homeless, you gave me a place to live. That's how you know sheep and goats. And the people who really are in great danger of their eternal destiny are the people who are rich. You know, a lot of people in this country are getting along and just making it paycheck to paycheck. But there are people out there in vocations, uh, vocations they have pursued on purpose for the purpose of the God of mammon and money, and they make a lot of money, and they are very well endowed, and they have more than enough and can easily help other people, especially people who are Christians. You know, now forget about just helping worldly people in need, Christian people, brothers and sisters 
who are struggling. And one reason or another, life has pulled the foundation pillars out from underneath them who find themselves in dire situations. And for these people to hear their cries and their needs and to turn their back on them, these people are goats. They're not sheep. They're not Christians. Jesus Christ will judge them harshly. They will go to hell. They will go to the lake of fire. This doesn't even get into, okay, what about if not only are they not meeting needs of people around them in their life, especially when they're easily able to meet needs, what about the ones who are on purpose, knowingly stealing from people, taking from people who are poor, people who are poor, not only do they not help them keep or get their daily needs and what they need in life, they take away the, thi the few things that they do have, also known as the sin of King David in the story of Uriah the Hittite. Well, it's not a story. It's a narrative. It's a true story. And Nathan, the prophet of King David, came up to him and said to David, the parable of the poor man with the sheep and the rich man who lived next door to him who had visitors come from afar. And uh, a terrible, ugly story uh, that when told a metaphor, David did not recognize that the story was about him. And he condemned the man in the story to Nathan. And Nathan the prophet said to King David, you are the man. And he was talking about when King David had Uriah the Hittite, one of his warriors that was in his army out to war, and King David slept with his wife, who he saw naked bathing on a rooftop, and got her pregnant, and he wanted to cover the pregnancy, uh, brought Uriah home, and had Uriah the Hittite uh, come back from the field of the army, and he wanted him to sleep with his wife, and so no, there was a way for him to account for his wife having a child. And Uriah refused to sleep with his wife, seeing that his comrades in arms were in harm's way out in the field, did not sleep in the same room with his wife when he was brought back from the battlefield. So David, the king, said to his commanders, okay, put this guy back out on the battlefield. And when you're in the heat of battle and you're on the front lines, I want you to pull back from him and leave him surrounded by the enemy, helpless. I want you to pull all the forces back. Let everybody in on this. And when Uriah and you are in the heat of battle, pull back from the front line quickly and leave him alone. Well, <clears throat> they did this. Uh, and so God was confronting King David through Nathan the prophet as to his sin and cursed his life and the life of his uh, his sons and the future kingdoms because of what he did. So there are people there today who call themselves Christians, who show up in church, who dress nice, who are rich, who in their private lives actually steal, kill, and destroy from Christian people around them and or blood relatives who are Christians around them and they do it knowingly on purpose. These people are far beyond the line that Jesus established that, well, you know, you kind of know some person, a kind of a stranger around town, and they're in need. And you have the ability to meet their needs, you know, and they ask you to help meet their needs, or don't a they don't ask you, and, uh, you know, you don't meet their needs. Uh, that's a lot different, uh, you know, somebody in need and you not meeting their needs that's a lot different from somebody being in need and you know the person who's in need you're able to help the person in need not only do you refuse to help them but you take what little they have left from them these people are going to hell in a handbasket these people may show up and have brass plaques all over the churches that they attend but they are most certainly goats and they're going to be in the lake of fire well, we know that Jesus said those that 
believe on him and his message are saved, and those that don't believe on him and his name and message are condemned to be residents in the lake of fire. Of mercy, empathy, sympathy, compassion are sheep. Those who do not do the word of God and do not live by his commands are goats. Sheep enter the kingdom, goats enter hell. Along with death, the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. So any churches wherein the official doctrine of the faith of their body, the denomination, corrupts or removes any of the teaching of Jesus Christ in any way are not churches. They are in apostasy. They are clubs that meet on a Sunday morning. They have a little entertainment up front for half an hour. And then they have an interesting study done in an archaeological fashion about something from the Old Testament. They are in denial of the faith. They are not Christian denominations. They are a cult if they are, as by Jesus' definition, goats and not sheep. The members inside of the church individually, are they goats? Are they sheep? By the fruit of the actions of their lives, you will know them. The fruit of their actions of their lives does not mean are they nice and smile at everybody and never swear and raise their voice. <laughs> that's, that's what we call fake Christian. You know, it's faking Christianity, making sure you do those minimal things. A false member of the body of Christ, a religion that is not teaching Christianity. It's a gray area. It's difficult for men to point out a black and white crossing over of the faith into apostasy and error. If denial of the power of modern day miracles is apostasy and denying the faith and denying the truth of the word of God, especially as found in the New Testament, the Gospels and the letters of the Apostle Paul, then many, many of our denominations qualify as cults and not true Christian denominations. The Lutheran churches, the Assembly of God churches, the Methodist church and the Baptist churches, to name a few, are just some of the denominations that at least deny the New Testament as the pure, untainted, true word of the living God in part, in specific sections. When you go through the letters, there are areas that they either won't ever read out loud in church or mention or study, or if they do read them out loud inside the church building, they will not refer to them. They will leave those verses alone and be very careful about churches, individual church houses or pastors or denominations that deny the New Testament as the untainted true word of the living God, either in whole or part. And there are variations in each denomination. And most denominations, like I said, they're all together on Jesus Christ as Lord. He's the Redeemer. He's the Lamb of God. He rose for our sins. We believe this. They either baptize babies or they baptize grown people. You know, they either consider salvation a gradual thing that comes through faith and evidence of the works of your life, or it's a five-minute prayer up front after a walk down the aisle in a church service at the end in a, what should we call them? The, not the mainline denominationals, the, the, uh, the modern uh, non-denominationals and the uh, Pentecostals. Some church pastors waver more or less from the official doctrine of their church fathers, from the adopted doctrines and agreed upon articles of their faith and from the practices of their denomination. So this is a very tricky thing here because departure from the faith and entering into being a cult can occur on a denominational basis in part or whole. It can occur on a church house, individual church building basis, or it can occur in a pastoral basis by one minister within a denomination. Now, the Assembly of God 40 years ago was a bastion of unvarnished New Testament preaching. They didn't care what anybody else thought of them. They gave great, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, at the end of the church service in an Assembly of God church back in the 1980s, as he was said, that's 35 years ago, 1985, uh, uh, 40 years ago, we'll take it back to 1979, 
And uh, you go to an assembly of God 40 years ago in the Bethlehem area. I attended one in the late 70s. And uh, uh, there was one up in the Pocono Mountains in the mid-80s that I went to for a few summers. And then uh, down in Florida, uh, the Assembly of God churches that existed in Lakeland, Florida, down in the 1980s, was phenomenal. And the, the greatest example of those was bulldozed about four years ago. The building, uh, they, they went bankrupt. They lost their membership. There was a split. They couldn't keep up the bills. The building itself and the ground was bulldozed. And the ground was sold off for office complexes. And it was probably, I would think, one of the greatest churches in the southeastern United States 35 years ago. Why it died? Uh, you know, my own personal opinion, Satan marked them out as a mover and a shaker and a genuine troublemaker for the kingdom of hell. And he attacked them and he won. He took them down. There is a church in my area. I won't even tell you the town it's in or the city, but there is a church within a 50 mile radius of me here that was doing phenomenal things. It looked like it was gonna be that kind of a church that I was talking about in Florida, up here in this area, a beacon of light for the area. And they were attacked. They were obviously spiritually attacked on multiple fronts up here. Uh, from what I understand, I don't have facts about this, but the down low on what happened at this church is there was an affair, there was a divorce, there was a suicide, there was all kinds of firings and or people quitting who were on staff, and you never saw it coming because it was a great church with uh, uh, fired up, uh, you know, the, the music and uh, the worship service was unparalleled. It went on for an hour and more. Uh, the teaching was great. It was right out of the Bible. But, you know, the Assembly of God 40 years ago, um, not what it is today, from what I've experienced and seen. Point one, okay, you want to know about a specific area. At the end of a church service 40, 35, 40 years ago, the churches I'm talking about, the pastor would invite you to the front, said, if you have a need, if you need prayer, if you want to seek God, if you want to talk to the Lord, I'll be up here uh, after the church service. and You can meet and talk with me or you can take private time and hit one of the steps yourself and you can pray in tongues out loud or you can pray quietly to yourself or you can pray in English. You know, we'll help or, or, or we'll leave you alone, whatever you want to do. But we will pray through and get your answers in your life for you and we'll join together and pull down the principalities and powers around the problem that is plaguing you at this point in time in the name of Jesus and they would pray through they, back then they would call it travailing prayer travailing in prayer and praying through until people got answers for real needs uh, <clears throat> there was a faith movement that came into play strongly around 1980 Kenneth E. Hagan was kind of the father of the faith movement and it started a whole movement revealing the spirit of the New Testament, uh, revealing uh, uh, a lot of God's good side. And what I consider uh, the God being an answer. Uh, you know, he wasn't your problem. He was your answer. And a counter move erupted against him and that movement in denominations, especially in the Pentecostal churches, who chose to criticize and argue with the uh, faith movement and the goodness of God. They couldn't handle that God's a good God and never says no. Or, you know, they they said, well, God sometimes says no, sometimes he says maybe, and sometimes he says wait. But faith says, and the Bible says, and the Word of God says, which is our, our measure, our tape measure and our plumb measure of the faith, nothing is impossible to those who believe. And Jesus said that nothing is impossible to those who believe. And he also said, uh, it was also in Luke chapter 1, it is said of God, nothing is impossible with God. And everybody acknowledges, everybody that says they're a Christian acknowledges, well, yes, 
Nothing is impossible with God. That's true. If God wants to do something, who's going to stop him? He can do anything. He can do miracles. It's Luke chapter 1. But as far as nothing is impossible to those who believe, come on. <laughs> you know, nothing is impossible to a mere believer, not God, who believes that when he prays or commands something to happen, it happens. <clears throat> well, I didn't write that. They didn't put that there. That was Jesus Christ, the second part of the triune God, who said that. He said, if you speak to a mountain and do not doubt, but believe that those things that you say will come to pass, that man will have whatsoever he says. And that was Jesus. That was the word of God himself who said that. He said, you know, if you, he cursed the fig tree and Peter was amazed. The next day it was dead from the roots up. And, uh, Here's a case in which Jesus did something negative and killed something. He killed a fig tree. He was upset. It was time for the fruit to be on the tree. There was no fruit there. And he was a little hungry and he wanted some. And uh, anyway, <laughs> nothing is impossible to them who believes. And Jesus said, if you even have a small amount of faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains. But, you know, we've blown all that off today, and our denominations have become apostate. Even the non-denoms and the Pentecostals, to a large degree, uh, are apostate in this tenet of doctrine of the Christian faith. Let's put it this way. Faithless, weak pastors, unable to bring about anything is possible miracles to their needy parishioners, Rather than to say my faith's just not there, I'm like the apostles that Jesus were, I lack the strength of faith to do the commands of Jesus and to do miracles and bring about miracles of the gifts, rather chose to blame God, not themselves, for the needs of Christians going unmet by faithless prayer and religious rituals, which were pro forma Christian, but in fact lacking the power of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That is, rather than say, I don't have the faith to believe for a miracle for you, brother or sister, said instead, it's not God's will to heal you or provide for you. Or God is teaching you something here, brother, by what you're going through. Or God is teaching you something, or worse yet, God has said no. You know, if God wanted to do this, he has the sovereign power to do this. And he didn't do this, so therefore God has said no. It is not God's will for him to meet this need of yours at this time. Or he said, maybe you're wait, or he'll think it over, or maybe there's more opportune time coming. None of which is in the scripture. You can't read New Testament passages that will back that up. A verse in Philippians says, <clears throat> you know, and you can cross-reference this all over the New Testament. You know, verses saying basically the same thing as Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's a pretty well-defined, black and white, easy to understand sentence. And yet, there are so many buts out there attached to that verse by pastors and their denominations. And the buts are there to make an ass of the people saying them. <laughs> the buts are there to make an ass of the people who are saying them. Butts are excuses to remove the pastors from blame for prayer failure. Butts take church pastors out of the ring of culpability and place them into the helpless, sidelined bleachers where God is in total and full sovereign control of everything. And we are merely helpless puppets, like so much flotsam, riding along the waves on the ocean, watching and spectating from the sidelines, unable to affect real difference or change in people's lives by merely praying. And in such apostate settings as that, rational church members in the pews are asking themselves, then why am I wasting my time praying to a God who is in total control and will do what he wants to anyway, and nothing I do or say matters? Great question, because the Bible in no way or form says that prayer is futile or useless or an exercise in a religious format. The prayer of faithful men avails much. You might say, Dave, the verse says the prayer of a righteous man 
avails much. Is the correct scripture. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. And God said to Abraham that his faith was imputed to him as righteousness. The righteous are saved by their faith through grace. Therefore, it is impossible to please God without faith, which is Hebrews 11, verse 6. Faith is righteousness to God the Father. Otherwise, you're judged by your works. And all have failed and come short of the glory of God and sinned to death by their mere works alone. If you're going on your works, pack pack some fireproof underwear, and it is a dry heat. Therefore, let your righteousness be by your faith, not by your works, lest you die in judgment over your sins by a holy God, in whom no man is guiltless by his mere works alone. Only Jesus Christ worked and achieved sinlessness on this earth. Only he was and is righteous by his works forever. We are righteous by his work forever, only by our faith in him, through the grace of God, that on purpose it might not be by works, but by faith, God having bound all men over to sin, that there would be no more Lucifers and men of pride who stand in their own supposed merits and holiness and righteousness without need of faith or grace. And that, of course, is a Romans passage. You know, God has bound all men over to sin, that he might have grace upon them all, that it might not be through works, but by faith through grace that they're saved. As such, as your pastors present themselves to you weekly on Sunday mornings, as righteous men by their works, they say that they walk holy lives, and apart from the faith and the grace of the blood of Christ, they are apostate. Unbelievers in the Word of God and leading you in a cult of misinformation and lies. I know a, a person or two, uh, let's just say I know a person or two, and they do a good many great works. And I believe they do not rely on faith alone. I believe they're relying on faith plus works, or possibly even just in their own minds and spirits, their works. And they're wide open to the devil. They're constantly attacked, physically, spiritually, financially. And, uh, you know, if you are under works only and you think you're getting to heaven on your own righteousness, you are wide open. You're not under grace. You're not under the blood. You're open to demonic attacks. And, uh, you know, the devil and the kingdom of hell is just going to shred you and come at you with attacks. And remember, it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle with. It's <clears throat> principalities and powers and demonic beings, which isn't taught much at all in, demon in the uh, mainline denominations today. You, they don't even tell their people, you know what, your problem is not the physical flesh people that are around you. It's the demonic spirits bind them. Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. That's where your warfare is. That's why you pray. You pray against and bind those things. You glorify and worship God to pray against and bind those things. Our good works only naturally develop from our faith and from our relationship with God our Father. We dwell in the vine. The vine causes us, the branches, to bear the fruit. The branches never bear fruit without benefit of the vine. If you're not in the vine, if you're not into Jesus Christ, or not into his word, you die. You wither and shrivel up. You don't bear fruit. The angels at the end of time gather you up and throw you into the furnace. Mark out any pastor who stands on any stage of any church platform who appears to be saying he's bearing fruit apart from the vine of Jesus Christ, who is bearing fruit in and of his own will, mental determination, willpower, and his own labor and work. Such a man has fallen from the grace. Let no man say he is or walks holy before God, save from purely the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes upon and in the Christian. That is, a man who says he has been sanctified by grace in the beginning of his walk with God, and as by the Spirit of God and by his personal growth and power, 
reached a point wherein he no longer sins, but he keeps himself and is sanctified and has by his willpower of his mind sanctified himself and does walk holy before a holy God, no longer needing pure grace from the blood for many such men depart, don't listen to them, for they have left the faith, they're apostate, and they've fallen from grace. Hence, you had people who began to think they were really something back in the 80s, 90s even, and they'd get up on platforms, and they thought that they walked sinless and pretty ho- much in holiness and righteousness. They have achieved a sanctification level. And then you'd read about these people being caught with prostitutes and in bed with whores. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Not marking them out. You know, it's not like they couldn't repent. But I'm just saying, take heed, lest you think you stand so that you do not fall. Don't don't get all up in about your own sanctification and righteousness. So... People who have fallen from grace. People who have left the faith. You know, one of the first things that will out about them is that they begin to think they're really something. And it shows. They become arrogant. They become kind of holiness and righteousness, preachiness about their own sanctification and works. To the point wherein any man of God in his teaching of the faith to the body departs from or denies or changes the New Testament, or denies the Old Testament, says the Old Testament is a dead thing, that man has departed from, denied, and corrupted the living word, and is leading men in a degree of error, apostasy, and damnation. The New Testament <clears throat> is a challenge and a hard thing to men who are full of pride and have so high self-esteem, who, who maybe were very gifted as children, you know, and Their mommy and daddies told them they were really special. Men of works, men of high self-esteem, having started in grace and being saved by Jesus Christ, they attempt to continue on independently of Jesus and his blood and his grace and to enter into the sin of the devil. The sin of the devil, the sin of pride, arrogance, attempting to place your own work on the altar of God Almighty as good enough, me and nothing else, worthy alone of their entrance into the kingdom of heaven. They do this by denying, changing, and departing from the New Testament, which is written, the written incarnation of Jesus Christ, the living word of God. They veer off into their own teaching in order to justify their faithless, impotent lives. <clears throat> okay, Dave, that's pretty good preaching, but wow, you must really have it all together. Have you arrived? (laughs) Have you arrived, Dave? You know, they asked Paul the same question, or Paul expounded on that question. Uh, You have it all together there, Paul? (laughs) Have you arrived? This is pretty preachy theological stuff. And he said, you know, he dove for the dirt. Paul said, I see as a man through a glass darkly. Or, you know, I'm like a man who's wearing sunglasses. But I'm striving, and I'm doing what I can to understand all this. Can I, as a man of faith in Jesus Christ, pray every time in faith, declare the word of God and before the world and before the throne of God and see miraculous results every time? I wish I could say yes. I have to say no. I see as through a glass darkly. I have not arrived. I'm not yet able to walk like Jesus did and heal everyone. To heal, to walk on water, to calm seas and walk through walls and stupefy Pharisees in their arguments. I'm close. (laughs) I have seen cancers dry up, shrivel, and die. I've seen miraculous instant healings. Uh, I myself have been uh, part of being, receiving miracles, uh, receiving. Okay, Benny Hinn laid hands on me one time. And I had a painful medical condition. This is decades ago. And uh, I had a painful medical condition, uh, you know, that most people wouldn't think a lot about. It wasn't a serious medical thing, but it was painful nevertheless. 
and hopefully it wasn't going to last a while. And uh, the pain instantly went, and I was instantly healed. Never had a problem since. So, you know, there are these miraculous results. There are men out there today who are raising the dead. There are, you know, I have uh, pretty good luck with the weather. and <clears throat> Not luck, but my faith is developed and I practice long enough in uh, specific prayer. It's just been an area of concern to me when some states start having these wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes, mudslides. I, my compassion goes out to them. I intercede on their behalf. And there's times when I've interceded on behalf of my own area uh, weather and uh, prayed to God. And God meets my needs through weather. There are things that he does for me which I'm not going to go into here and now. And uh, apart from his miracle intervention in my behalf, uh, life would be harder. So I strive as Paul did to attain the high calling and walking as Jesus did, doing his works. I buffet my mind with the word of God as to the declarations of John chapter 17. I meditate on the fact I am one with God in Christ, Jesus living with inside of me and I living with inside of him, according to Ephesians, one with him, seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the body of Christ on planet earth, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Even now, as I type this, according to Ephesians chapter 1, as written by the Apostle Paul, in attempting to get this over to the Ephesians. And so the modern church of Jesus Christ does its best to separate themselves from Jesus. Even though Paul said, we are the body of Christ, in the literal meaning, our hands are his hands, our feet are his feet. That's why Paul cautioned men not to join themselves to a prostitute. He says, in so doing and dating a whore, you've joined Jesus Christ himself in his body to a whore. But we are the real, literal, living temple of God of the Holy Spirit of the living God. That's not said often enough in church. As walking in faith with God inside of us and commanded to imitate him in his faith and works of the gifts of the Spirit, one with him in dwelling the vine and eating his flesh, drinking his blood by meditating on the word, which is him who is the word of God, that is reading and studying the Bible and getting it into our hearts and spirits. We are capable of bearing fruit by manifested works of the gifts of the Spirit. So, given the Word of God and the proclamation of the command of Christ that we call the Great Commission, we are, as a body, commanded to go preach the good news into all the world, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. To the extent any man or denomination denies the great commission of Jesus Christ, who never changes, to the extent any man or Christian denomination denies the great commission, who never changes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's not a respecter of persons. If Benny Hinn does it, you're capable of doing it. But commands not one here or there, but everyone, everywhere, in the faith of Christianity, to the extent anyone or anything denies the healing of the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and casting out the demons, to that extent they've denied the faith and are in apostasy before the word of God, and have fallen from grace and are a cult, and not in fact a Christian. So at least the attempt must be made to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse and cast out the demons. The prayers must be offered. Any man refusing to hear Jesus saying nothing is impossible to those who believe, any man refusing to hear all things are possible with God, that man has left the faith. Therefore, I mock and turn my gaze on the multitude of institutions of religion who are Christian, who say they believe and teach the faith, who along with 2,999 other denominations say that they have the light and the way. And I say to the extent you leave the word in the New Testament and preach excuses for denying or changing what is written there 
and make allowances for your own lack of faith, excuses for why you don't believe what is there, you, in fact, are a cult and not of the Christian faith. Oh, if we could only get Christian pastors of the church to read and study the Bible, especially the New Testament, a lot would begin to change on planet Earth. Miracles would happen. There would be more unity in the body. When I was in Bible college, it didn't take me being a rocket scientist to figure out things being said in the classroom by professors against other teachers of the Word of God outside of their own denomination in the body of Christ on planet Earth that day who were line by line going through the New Testament, preaching the New Testament, and were receiving criticism. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out these men were not of God in criticizing other Christian ministries, other Christian denominations, other Christian pastors who were teaching the Bible that they themselves shrank back from and twisting their words. And the, I won't repeat some of the slanders I've heard. I won't repeat some of the epithets I've heard personally in classrooms from professors' mouths, men who were trained in the doctrines and were turning out future pastors. You know, if they had 30 people in their class and they all became pastors, and each one of those people had a congregation of 100 people, that, that alone tells you, well, there you go. You know, 30 times 100. Just 100 people in their denominations. That's 3,000 people that they're affecting just in that class. In the future, those people will be affecting a total of 3,000 plus people. Stop reading books about the Bible. Read the Bible. Stop reading human psychology. Stop reading, getting your all of your philosophy from the Reader's Digest or philosophies of men, either, whether recent or ancient philosophies. Yes, I had to take them in college. Yes, I had philosophy in Florida Southern College. I had philosophy in Muhlenberg College. At a Lutheran college, at a Methodist college, uh, read the New Testament. Don't go through five chapters a day of the Bible. Read and meditate on, understand, think about a portion of the Bible, but every day. If you read and meditate on one verse in the Bible in a day, and it changes your life, and you look up the original Greek, maybe, or in Strong's, and research, you know, okay, these translators, these hundred different Bible versions, which, you know, basically the different versions and translations of the Bible, they're the same. There are not great differences in translations. Here and there, there are passages that I prefer one translation of the Bible over another. But I myself have five or six uh, favorite uh, versions of the Bible. I like the New International. I like the New Living Translation. And it's not a paraphrase. The New Living Bible was. But uh, the New Living Translation is a translation. I like the uh, King James Version for its own benefits and merits. I like uh, the Berean Study Bible. Uh, and you can go on. A uh, New English Bible. I love that. I love the New English Bible. There's areas where the, just the way they say things, it just nails the meaning of the verse that kind of isn't caught as well in the New International Version or the New American Standard Version or the New Living Translation. <clears throat> so if you read and meditate on the Bible, and uh, you know, it's not a bad idea if you don't have access to a computer or if you don't have access to online Bible study sites or don't know where to find them or can't take a computer with you everywhere, if you have a couple of versions of the Bible with you, that's not a bad idea. Um, you'd be surprised how many times the King James Version is right. And I'm not a King James Version only person, but I get what people who say that are saying. Uh, if you read parallel verses, especially you take the very important verses of the Bible, 
stuff that uh, is life-changing, like Philippians 4.19. And I said to myself, when I first studied that verse, I said, you know, rather than just read a translation or two and see what they, and they all basically say that exactly the same thing. Let's go to the Greek and see what the original literal Greek is. And then we can go to the original Greek words and strongs and we can look up what the shades and variations of those words are and see if maybe the translators might have missed it. And maybe if there's a better word for, you know, each of these words, because this verse is so, their verse is so powerful that if you're going to stand on that verse in front of the devil and the needs in your life and in front of people who are naysayers in your life who don't believe the Bible, uh, Philippians 4.19, you know the verse says, My God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, if you're going to stand on that verse, you build your faith by knowing exactly what it says and what you think you know it says. It is an enabling, encompassing verse in the New Testament. Great is the temptation to limit that verse, to make excuses on behalf of God, to make excuses for our lack of faith. I say embrace it, eat his flesh, drink his blood, dwell in the vine of Jesus Christ in print, which is the word of God. After all, Jesus is the incarnate, inbreathed version of the word of God, the second being in the Trinity in whom we live and breathe and have our being. There's many, many astounding, miraculous promises in the New Testament. Please do no violence to the word of God by passing them over and disregarding them and taking them as if you were reading metaphors, similes, literature. Other books are fantasy. This book, the word of God, is reality. It is truth. It is the seed bag of faith. It is the answer to your prayers. It is the foundation of your faith and of your one true religion, Christianity. Well, this discussion will be continued, no doubt. I'm enjoying this myself. There are some concepts in here that are very hard to get over. And no doubt, no wonder, because people trust their pastors. They trust their denominations, especially if you were born and raised in a denomination and you were bathed constantly in your denomination. Why do you need to read your Bible? After all, you have this man who was paid to go, paid a lot of money to go to college and seminary to learn all about the Bible. <laughs> oh, innocent little babe, if only you knew how small a part of the education of ministries, ministers in seminaries or Bible colleges is the actual study, the actual verses of the Bible. You take away the sciences, the English courses, the speech classes, the hermeneutics, the doctrines classes. You take away the, the foreign languages and the philosophy and the sociology and the psychology and the marriage and family classes. You strip it down to, you know, the quick little, you take away the Greek and the Hebrew for sure. Nobody knows Greek if you just study it one year. Nobody knows Hebrew if you just study it for one year. You know, if you took French or German in high school and you had three or four years of French or German, are you fluent today in, in French or in German? Can you carry on a language? Uh, can, can you carry on a conversation with a member of Germany or France? I don't think so. I know I can't. I had three years of Latin. I had four years of German. I had a year of Russian. I can't converse with any natives from those countries. Uh, you know, uh, well, Latin is, you know, the forerunner of Italian and Spanish languages and the French languages. And I can't converse in those languages with any people from those lands from just three or four years of that language. So the point is, people go to Bible college or seminary to learn what the tools are, where the tools are, and how their, their real training comes after they leave the school, kind of like lawyers. You don't want a lawyer who just came out of law school. You want a lawyer who's been around and has some street smarts and has practiced in the courtrooms for a few years. Because uh, lawyers just out of law school, all they know is where to find the resources they need to look up the cases they're trying to pursue. And usually they're under, they take on such a heavy crush of caseloads, 
per week. There's no way they're going to be able to give quality time to your individual case. Uh, you know, basically, lawyers are living to send out bills and make money. And you can't do that if you work like Perry Mason for weeks on individual cases. You have to, I know one lawyer, I'm not going to mention their names, I'm not going to tell you where they live, I just know of a lawyer who had said in an interview, stupidly in print, that they take approximately 50 cases a week. And these individual cases, you know, they can charge between $1,000 and $1,500 just for a standard thing. So that's 50 grand a week, and you know, times 10 weeks a year. Uh, 10 weeks times 50 grand is 500 grand, and then times another five times because there's not 10 but 50 weeks in a year. That's two and a half million dollars that that law firm uh, with that one lawyer can take in in a year, millions in a year. And and how do you think they want to set it up? Do they want to set up it so that they do a really good job on each individual case and barely get by as a lawyer? and barely pay off their tuition at their law school? Or do you think they want to just print money and rake it in? You know, to a degree. I won't get into this right now, but the medical profession is guilty of that kind of thing. Well, do we go for the money, or, or are we here to help people? You know, uh, ministries. Uh, now, the church is a lot more difficult because, <laughs> thankfully, pastors don't charge people individually for their services. But what I'm saying is the training that they got, the three or four years of Bible College and or uh, seminary, probably the actual Bible courses where they studied the Bible was a small part of their, if they, you know, if you just went into a seminary or a Bible college and you just learned Bible, there's no English classes, no math, no science, no philosophy, no no sociology and psychology, no sciences of man. If you strip all that away, just study the Bible, you know, seriously, maturely, in classrooms for four years, wow, yeah, we would have some mature Christian leaders out there. But unfortunately, the denominations trust that once these men get out into churches and in pulpits of their own, they're going to consider passages of the word and what the word means and continue to research the word of God for themselves so just because a man has or does not have a seminary degree or a Bible college degree does not make him a pastor or not a pastor uh, so in judging denominations this is how we get 3,000 denominations because the Bible is so lightly regarded and so lightly studied today by the men of God in pulpits. And they can't connect the dots across the different books in the Bible and understand what they're reading. I, I have heard stuff from pulpits and in Bible study classes on Wednesday nights. I have heard things that made my skin crawl coming out of men with doctorates in theology, ordained ministers of God, sitting there telling me stuff that was 180 degrees opposed to what you read in the Bible and what God's Word says. Just astounding. So, I think somewhere Paul said, work out your own salvation with trembling and serious thought and sober concern because... This is what I'm trying to get across to you. Don't let the man in the pulpit in your local church house and your local denomination be responsible for you either making it into heaven or not making it into heaven and going to the bad place because <clears throat> they might be wrong. And if there are 3,000 denominations, if one of them out there, if one denomination in our country of Christian churches, one Christian denomination of religious faith for Jesus Christ has it absolutely right. That still means there are 2,999 other denominations that have gotten it wrong. 
And, you know, if you just look at the difference between the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church, the Pentecostal Churches, and the Assembly of God, they're so different from each other. The, the Lutheran Church is nothing like the Assembly of God churches, especially of 30, 40 years ago. The Catholic Church services are nothing like Pentecostal services. Mainline denominational churches versus uh, non-denominational. Non-denominational church services, even in their own denominations, like I said, growing up in the Lutheran faith, you have your Lutheran pastors and you have your Lutheran pastors. You have some guys that are pretty pretty sports-minded and athletic and uh, happy-go-lucky, and you got your guys that are kind of uptight and are bookworms and and their letter of the law, they're very strict, and you know, and, and you've got guys who are who are uh, very serious about their calling and about Christian ministry, and then you've got guys who, you know, it's obvious it's a paycheck for them. It's uh, they're there to collect the money every two weeks, and uh, for them it's a means of making a living, and their thing is the family and their extracurricular activities. And it's easy to tell who these guys are. Because when 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon comes, good luck getting a hold of your local minister or pastor or church house because they're gone. (laughs) Now, I know my dad, who was a Lutheran minister, Reverend Long, from the St. John's Lutheran Church in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I know that my dad walked in the light that he had and did the best that he could because... There was no such thing as voicemail or an answering machine with him. Uh, When Dad was out of the house, this was before they had prevalency of pagers and uh, smartphones that you could take with you, and before they had the Internet and email, and before they had, uh, you know, all they had was phones. And they did have answering machines. For like 100 bucks. you could buy a little machine that would tape people's incoming calls to you uh, he never used one of those, but they had them. Um, so when my dad was in the ministry, we were all on the payroll. We were all part of his job in our house at, at the parsonage, in in the home. Everybody in town had the home phone number for Pastor Long, or his home phone. We could call his landline directly. Pastor Alfred Long would pick up the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. You called that phone number at the church parsonage, which was in the phone book and in the white pages at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, he would pick it up. He's the one who would answer. And when he was running around the uh, Lehigh Valley area visiting patients in hospitals and going to meetings and uh, meeting with shut-ins in their own homes and giving communion and things like that, and the phone would ring. Of course, he didn't have a phone with him on the road. He didn't have mobile phones. He didn't have uh, cellular phones he could take with him. And the phone would ring, and he was out there, and he wouldn't be back for an hour or so. <clears throat> mother, my mother would pick it up, or one of the, the three sons, and we'd take the message. That was a given. Uh, you know, you're part of the pastor's family. This was part of his job. He expected you to do this. When the phone rings in a Lutheran parsonage uh, 30, 40 years ago, you pick it up. You answer the person, you give them as much information as possible, you take down the name and the number, you leave a message. So how different it is today where pastors just shriek at the idea of you even having their personal landline home phone number. They don't want you to have their home phone number. You call their ministry, you get the church building, and you get an answering or a voicemail computer machine in there, and it says, leave an answer, leave a message after the beep, and we'll get back to you. And what really drives me insane is the, the ones with uh, computer menus where you have to push numbers to get various people in various departments. You know, So basically, you, you can actually have a church ministry where you can't reach anybody ever, where you know, you're, you're free to email them if you can find out their email addresses. And if you can get a phone to them and if you can get them to pick up a phone it's a minor miracle and to me that's an apostasy that's a a cult 
uh, uh, that's not a New Testament minister in the church. Somebody who doesn't put their home phone down for the church members to readily get at, for them to be able to reach them 24-7, that's a hireling. That's not a shepherd. They're in, they're, their little church building is a cult. Their church building is not a Christian church. So, oh well, that's another rant. You know, I might do a whole sermon on just that uh, pastoral accountability. And, and I wish that it would be in denominations recommended against to individual pastors to put people through to voicemail to computers when they call the church or they want the office or they want they have a need and they want it met and you know if it's prayer you know so the pastor can be notified and they get a prayer chain going or something pull down that stronghold pray through for that need and and it's just unbelievable uh, unbelievable to me that today in today's world with as much communication and as much cellular phones and iPads and iPods and and uh, you can leave messages by email, etc., 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 that we have so very little communication, in fact. And the pastors have used it as a way of doing less, much less, and blowing people off with a line or two. I, I remember a few years ago, once again, I'm not going to tell you the church, the pastors, where it was located. I had a really big need. It was a life-changing need. And it wasn't medical, and it wasn't in healing. Uh, it it <clears throat> happened to lie in it. Uh, I, the area in which it, the needs lied, it, it was several different areas. It involved politics, it involved finances, it involved uh, legal, technical areas of civil law, and things like that. And But it was a severe uh, need and I needed to get a hold of somebody and either uh, get help in that area or to have somebody willing to go into the church nave and sit down with me and kneel before God and pray through till we had an answer to the thing. And uh, they weren't there. And I left messages. I, I went to the church on Sunday morning several times. I talked with an assistant pastor and uh, they said, well, it's out of my hands uh, I, I can't deal with that it, it's not in my area uh, of authority and uh, they never told the senior pastor when they got back from vacation or their tooth appointment or whatever it was and uh, the need was not addressed through them so <sighs> these people have no idea how close they're walking to the edge they may be Christian they may love the Lord Jesus Christ, they may be sincere. I'm talking about church pastors with degrees who are ordained, who have little sheepskins, who said, I am a real, <laughs> you know, you can give to me and you can deduct it from your taxes. And uh, uh, these people are in serious danger for their eternal destinies because Jesus was very clear about about uh, meeting needs and about uh, <sighs> Jesus was very clear in instructions to to his apostles and to the disciples and to people he sent out to witness and to the church in general and uh, versus the goats and sheep thing that's what I'm talking about and so you can judge yourself and go over your own life and go well I know what the criteria for being a sheep is, and I know what the criteria for being a goat is. Which side of the line am I falling on? And uh, makes me shudder to think that there are pastors of Christian ministries who uh, are falling short in these areas. And they're goats by obvious observation of their life and empirical experience of dealing with these people they're goats because they're they're not open closed for the day shingle goes up at four o'clock in the afternoon and they don't open till nine in the morning and at nine in the morning you get your five minutes and that's it they don't pray through anymore 
They don't get personally involved with people. They, they're involved with programs and putting out their 10-minute sermons <laughs> on Sunday morning. So, oh well, this is Dave Long. And uh, if you want to contact me, thanks for stopping by and listening to The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long on the YouTube channel. And if you have a need or a concern and you would like me to address it with you either by email or uh, if you drop me an email and it's an emergency and you would like to talk to me personally when I get the message and uh, I will try to call you back on my personal phone number but uh, my email is tattoopierced at live.com one of my emails and that's spelled T-A-T-O-O P-I-E-R-C-E-D it's one T in tattoo pierced well not instead of having three T's there's two T's in it not T-A-T-T but T-A-T I know why did I do that <laughs> I, I misspelled tattoo okay I originally put it down when I signed up with live.com I thought tattoo had one T in it in the center T-A-T-O-O I was wrong <laughs> so everybody gets that email wrong tattoo pierced at live.com we're ready to pray with you personally seven days a week excluding hours of 10 o'clock at night till 8 in the morning probably because I'll be asleep <laughs> or eating breakfast I, I've, I also run kind of I'm, I'm almost an animal shelter I'm dealing with some feral animals and one of them uh, had babies a couple of months ago and I'm dealing with that right now so when they're crying in the morning and they need to be cleaned up after and they have to be kept separate from other parts of the household you know I'm on it I'm up at six in the morning so it's not like I don't get up till late I'm up at six maybe five sometimes four in the morning and sometimes I don't go to sleep till midnight but uh I do have some personal time that I kind of reserve for myself but if I'm across the computer and I see a severe emergency need and it's nine o'clock at night uh, I probably will respond to the email or call you and we'll go to prayer at least for a few minutes to address that problem immediately so we delight in personal ministry by email or by phone just leave a message and say help I need supernatural help from Jesus email me or, or text me uh, at that email address and uh, if you call and we aren't there to pick up leave a message send us an email uh, for the shepherd's voice this is dave long